Hi there, everyone. Come on in. We've got seats at the Kumo Theater located right next to the bar. Come grab a drink and join us. And those of you that are here already, let's hear a rousing, rousing welcome for Aaron Bauckham from Candid Partners. Welcome. Good work, people. Go and get started? Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So I uh, hope the show is going well for everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, it's a 15-minute presentation to talk about moving a mainframe in AWS. So there's a lot of compressed content. So we're going to take questions after the presentation. Uh, we're at booth 1608. We can follow up with anything after the talk. So my name is... Uh, Hold on. Okay. So my name is Aaron Bauckham. Uh, I'm the chief architect at Candid Partners. Candid Partners is an AWS consulting firm. We help organizations kind of start their journey to the cloud and kind of see them through all the way to optimizing how they operate in the cloud, being able to be the most effective uh, IT operations in the cloud. We really like solving really tough problems using AWS cloud solutions, especially cloud native solutions like serverless and Lambda. We also have a side of the business around uh, management consulting. We really like uh, working on really difficult, tough enterprise challenges that happen in large corporations around business and people and communication and process problems. So that's what we're really focused on. So we're here today to talk about a project that we've been working on for the last year, which is to move a uh, enterprise mainframe into AWS. When we first started working with our client, they asked us, you know, how do we, how do, we do this? How can we move a mainframe into AWS? And we, when we started thinking about it, it, kind of, we started thinking about it the way Steven Spielberg thinks about movies before he makes them. We, you know, he would say, can we, can we get away with this? Can we, can we actually get away with moving a mainframe to the cloud? That seems crazy to be able to do that. Um, and when we first started, we thought we were the first. So uh, we had since found out during this project that there was another mainframe that's gone live into AWS. But we didn't know that at the time, and so we really couldn't gain uh, any of the, the benefit for understanding how to do it. So we really kind of started from scratch and uh, had to do a lot of lesson uh, learn on ourselves. Um, and we, we, through the process, we, are, we, we focus a lot on cloud-native solutions and cloud-based capabilities. But we started, when we started working with the enterprise and, and mainframe teams, we found that we really had to start changing how we uh, worked with those teams. So uh, during this project, I, I sat down with the program lead for this client, and he said, so you're the mainframe guy. So it's, uh, um, it was kind of challenging to be able to figure out, OK, you know, yes, I'm the mainframe guy. We're going we're gonna to talk about how to be able to move the mainframe. So is this even possible? Is it possible to be able to move a 40-year-old mainframe into AWS? So the mainframe was an IBM Z-Series mainframe uh, running ZOS 1.9. Uh, it's been out of support for over a decade. And to kind of give you an idea, I did a little research of you know, how old is that, right? So in, in 1974, at the gas station, gas was 42 cents a gallon. In theaters, people were watching Blazing Saddles. In retail stores, pocket calculators were starting to be sold. At work, your mom and dad started using a word processor machine that was sitting on their desk. On TV, we first met the Fonz. And in football, Peyton Manning and Tom Brady were not born yet. And also, 1974, a piece of code was compiled to process data for this client, and it was not recompiled until this year, 42 years later, in order to migrate it to AWS. So it really puts into perspective, you know, here's how old this code is, and how do you, how do you work with code that old to be, uh, to be able to move it to AWS? But what I can promise you and assure you as part of this presentation is once you go through and you see all this, you're going to say, really, that's it? That's really all you, you know, that's really all that you had to do was to do that? Um, that's a big lesson learned is it really just comes down to some, some, some fairly simple uh, problems to be able to pull this off. And why would someone do that? Why would you move a mainframe? Well, largely because of cost. Uh, when you start looking at eight-figure run, uh, uh, run rate costs for mainframes, 
being able to reduce that by 65%, even if it's a re-platform, is a really big ROI to be able to accomplish that. So we knew it wasn't going to be easy. And so some of the things we started hitting pretty quick is that it was difficult to get usage information. Connection info, IO rates, we couldn't get it all. Getting CPU usage information was very difficult. Um, subject matter experts with tribal knowledge of the entire platform were disappearing. Uh, my favorite part of this project was uh, the, the RACF expert, who was the only person who knew everything there was to know about security discretionary access control for the entire mainframe for billions of dollars flowing through the system, was a 75-year-old lady who really wanted to retire. And she really did not want to actually keep working on this. So you know, we were basically begged her, please stay to help us through this migration to get this thing into AWS. A lot of source code forensics had to happen. So a lot of sifting through um, the source code repository, looking at thousands of components and dependencies between con uh, components had to happen. Another major difficulty was cloud licensing models. So software vendors are still trying to figure out how to license their software in the cloud. Most software license agreements are based off of on-premise based licensing um, capabilities. In the cloud, now you can not only have a production environment, but you can also have a staging environment and a test environment, QA and dev. So if a piece of software costs $150,000, are you not going to pay that five times? Right? So being able to uh, work with those software vendors to be able to figure out how to license that uh, was one of the things that we worked through during the project. So at a glance, uh, Candidate Partners, uh, what we did was set up the program management, project management, test coordination, cloud architecture, and software recommendations working with procurement on licensing negotiation. So how do we figure out, you know, how do we scope the migration? How do you figure out how to break this thing down? So a project structure had to be set up that included the program management, which included oversight, planning, Assurance, alignment, process, stakeholder engagement, and dependency management was one of the biggest things that we had to do from a program management perspective. What things did this mainframe depend on and what things depended on the mainframe? From a project management structure, being able to set up roles and responsibilities and, and, and uh, figuring out which teams were responsible for what uh, was another big aspect of the project management. The migration approach was based off of a uh, discovery and analysis that took three months. The order of the migration, we started with database DB2, uh, collapsing IMS and Datacom down into DB2. VSAM and generational data were moved. Online was moved over a two-month time frame, and batch was moved over a four-month time frame. And the cutover for the mainframe on-premise to AWS was designed to happen over the weekend. So that's the migration approach. The architecture was based off of the AWS well-architected framework. So a lot of infrastructure definition had to be set up with DevOps automation defining the actual mainframe infrastructure as code so that during the process, the changes to the infrastructure could be made and handled in a DevOps fashion. Being able to set up cloud storage, cloud archiving, capacity planning, and most importantly, integrating with operations, security, and governance approval processes. This was one of the most important things we did from an architecture perspective. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, get to it in a minute, but one of the most interesting things was that there were several integrations that happened directly to the database that didn't go through online or batch. And to be able to control that, we actually had to convert RACF security access control into DB2 schema um, permissions. So that was an interesting outcome of the project as well. From a sizing perspective, we found that MIPS, MSU, and ITR are not the greatest indicators of capacity on a mainframe. There's actually some other techniques to be able to uh, figure out how much usage information on the mainframe is taking place. Uh, in terms of processing, it was a medium-sized mainframe. It was 28 business applications, 200 and 266 integration points and 1.6 terabytes of live data. So not massive and not small, it was kind of in the middle. On the vendors and partners, there were eight software vendors involved and four professional services firms. And the four professional services firms were broken into two core teams actually doing the migration, uh, a lot of the source code, analysis, and uh, translation, and then two other teams supporting those teams. 
The methodology for the migration, we chose to use interface emulation versus x86 emulation. There are some mainframe migrations that can actually do x86 translation of IBM instruction set at execution time. We found that from a processing perspective, that interface emulation for online and batch was a better fit. And so we used source code translation tools to be able to migrate and recompile that on x86 to be able to get much better performance. And we'll talk about uh, the performance gains we got uh, a little bit later. Sourcing the tools, so engaging with procurement, being able to do license negotiations, uh, specifically ISV, the ISV vendor that would provide the software emulation, as well as the supporting tools that would provide the source, uh, the source code translation from lots of different types of exotic languages that end up on a 40-year-old mainframe. And application rationalization is figuring out which applications should or should not move. So out of the 28, two were retired, and 26 were actually moved. So architecting for the cloud. One of the biggest lessons learned was licensing. It turned out that licensing, software licensing, had the biggest impact on technical architecture in the cloud. When we first started, we thought, well, we want to make sure that the performance that we had on a big, giant metal mainframe, that we could get the same level of performance in the cloud. So we thought, we'll just use X1s, because X1s are really powerful and we'll be able to use them. But when you have supporting software, that has licensing costs that are in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're licensed per core, that suddenly on an X1, where you have 128 virtual CPUs, you basically lose a lot of the advantage of moving to the cloud. So we found that being able to figure out that licensing up front was very important. From a disaster recovery perspective, uh, we used EBS snapshot replication between uh, disaster recovery regions. For high availability, we use auto scaling, min one, max one on the application and database server to be able to make sure that the system stayed up, but also to limit our software licensing costs so that the same uh, software license could be used. Security control mapping, we used enterprise AD authentication and authorization for three primary access points for SSH based console access privileged escalation of commands, and green screen TN3270 authorization. So we're able to preserve that experience that users had, but do it through AD, Active Directory Authentication Authorization. From oper an operationalization perspective, we use CloudWatch logging and Splunk for security and operational dashboards and analytics. So this is the actual architecture for uh, the deployment. So you can see a production VPC and a non-production VPC. You can see that there's two primary processing components, the online and the batch-based processing with authentication. You can see that there's encrypted EBS snapshots that are supported on both the application server and the database server. And that's kind of one of the, really the, the, the core things to observe here is that the entire mainframe really boiled down to two EC2 instances. Now, there's some other supporting EC2 instances, but just two primary servers of an application server and a database server. There's three primary interface points. Those are numbered here, so FTPS, to make sure that we didn't have to change all 260 integrations uh, that maybe use FTPS to something more modern like SFTP. We're able to actually make sure that that continued to work the same way uh, in AWS. The, uh, using MQ as a message broker. And then there were some applications that had direct access to the data, and that was through Oracle Gateway, uh, actually through database views, through um, Oracle into DB2. So and this is, again, 40 years of integrations and processing and interfaces boil down to this architecture. So one of our key lessons found over the last year of migrating this mainframe to AWS is that moving a mainframe is just a, is, is equivalent to managing a really big project. So, the, the fact of being able to manage dependencies between systems and between teams, being able to establish timelines and be able to meet deliverables was the biggest lesson we learned, that there's nothing specific to the technology that makes it hard. It's just managing a large project. The source code analysis tools and the translation tools are out there, and they're becoming very intelligent to be able to do this. Uh, the time using this approach, the time to first app in the cloud was six months. 
Um, the coordination between teams was also very key. Um, being able to establish communication channels and how teams were going to rely on each other, uh, being able to establish those estimates and make sure those estimates were met were very important. And again, we, want, we found out that two core teams was really important for coordination between uh, all the teams that were involved. We also found that new migration technology enables faster and less risky migrations. Hybrid migrations are now possible. So when we first started, we thought that the only way to migrate was to move all applications or none of them. There is now new technology that is now on the market and available that makes it possible to be able to have some applications that are modernized, that may work in cloud native based uh, infrastructure capability, that still integrate the same way with existing applications through um, application oriented regions or file oriented regions that may exist on a mainframe. And the, the last uh, key lesson was we got way better performance in the cloud than we did on a giant mainframe. So we found that the R4 instances that run the application in the database were more than enough processing and memory needed to be able to process billions of transactions through this system. So that was a, a really big lesson learned for us. Here you see the list of you know, old software and new software that were used as a part of the migration. So it's kind of a mix of purchase software. There's lots of you know, weird languages uh, that are used as a part of mainframe applications. So if we look at Ideal or IBI Focus, you know, these are these, these languages and, and applications for querying and manipulating data that were used on the mainframe. And what we did was find open source or commercial equivalents that allowed us to be able to run that on x86 and a very, a very small amount of open source as well. So if you're going to try this yourself, there's a few key recommendations. So first, get licensing figured out up front. So being able to figure out your architecture based on your licensing before any source code translation, before any actual engineering work begins. Being able to get that figured out is a very big lesson. Being able to fight the right, find the right customer modernization target. So what that is is being able to figure out, are we re-architecting? Are we re-platforming? Are we going to do a hybrid? Getting that figured out up front is a very key lesson. Finding the right source translation vendors. Now, this is one of the things that I would recommend is there's a lot of tools out on the market, and the ones you want to gravitate towards are the ones that offer the most sophisticated form of analysis. There are tools out there now that really apply almost artificial intelligence to be able to figure out dependencies within source code. Those are the tools that you're going to want to use, that you're going to want to investigate time and effort in to figure out how to be able to accomplish this. Another big lesson, get batch working before online. Online is a very uh, straight, direct, transactional based capability for processing, whereas batch has a lot of dependencies. You know, this batch job depends on this batch job, depends on this batch job. So getting that figured out first is more important in being able to get that migrated uh, from a complexity perspective than online-based processing. And the last is empathy. So one of the things we found is that the user base, when we first started, was, was very tentative about this process. They were very used to the mainframe that they had been using for over 20 years and gotten very used to. And so suddenly introducing a, a massive migration like this was kind of nerve-wracking. So what we chose to do is to take an empathetic approach where we took ambassadors and advocates that they had worked with in the past to work with them to get them acclimated to the concept. And by the end of the migration, the users were rooting for the migration team more than anyone else. You know, come on, let's go, let's get, let's get this happen, let's make this work, let's make this cutover happen. So that was really a, a fantastic thing that happened during the project was turning tentative kind of users that are afraid and scared into cheerleaders. So that was a really um, uh, good lesson learned that I would recommend you do the same if you're able to try this. That's it. Um, we have a booth, uh, 1608. It's right next to CloudAbility. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions that you may have uh, about this project. Thanks for your time. <laughs>